So basically, essentially, you're suggesting more uh, power transfer from uh, like countries to uh, sort of global organizations. And at page 32, you you wrote that we need to ask uh, whether nations uh, need to give more sovereignty to new organizations like uh, uh, United Nations, uh, International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, World Health Organization. But one of the reasons why, at least here, people voted for uh, Brexit was uh, sovereignty and disagreement with policies developed by unelected uh, Eurocrats and technocrats. So people wanted to take back sovereignty. Well, I mean, uh, let me say, I mean, uh, as a as someone who was uh, uh, very strongly against Brexit and think it's a major mistake, uh, which was uh, uh, achieved by a very dishonest campaign by Johnson and his colleagues, um, which people will regret in the next few years, um, I strongly disagree. Because um, uh, um, do you think Mr. President Macron is worried about losing sovereignty? Because he's in the EU, certainly not. And are we gaining sovereignty? We're just losing authority. We'll be more marginalised. And uh, just to take one example, um, we, are, uh, we, we say that we are uh, sovereign, um, but um, uh, our power stations are being built by French and Chinese organisations. Our trains, they may be privatised, but they're owned by, uh, uh, partly owned by uh, foreign governments. Um, and uh, uh, our car factories, um, are mainly owned by Japanese or German companies. Uh, so uh, it's complete nonsense to say that we are an, an economically independent nation. Uh, we are, um, um, in many of our facilities, uh, foreign-owned, and this need not be a bad thing necessarily, uh, but um, it just means it's absurd to try and be a little England again. For scientific research, it's really bad. Well, well that's one, but there are more, more important things than, than that for the av- for the average public, and uh, um, so, so uh, and, and the, the latest op- opinion polls showed that uh, I think a majority was now against Brexit. And of course, we, when they realise what it actually involves in the next six months, um, I predict that um, more and more people will regret uh, that we ever went through with it. Um, it, it was, um, uh, and, but going back to what we were saying earlier, um, uh, it was um, a, a debate where uh, the people who um, voted for Brexit were often the people who f- did not feel empowered. They felt left behind. Um, and um, uh, they, they thought this was the consequence of uh, being in the EU. In fact, it wasn't. It was a fault of the uh, present government's austerity policies, which was um, weakening public services, etc. And similarly in America, um, th- there was um, uh, a feeling that workers had been left behind because, of course, there's even less of welfare states in America than here. Uh, so um, there's good reason why many people in a very inegalitarian society should have felt aggrieved. But they were entirely mistaken to believe that uh, either Mr. Trump in the US or Mr. Johnson in this country was going to do anything to improve their lot. It, it, uh, because the, the mantra of the present government is low taxation, Etc., uh, and not to improve the, the welfare state. So uh, I think um, uh, it was a sort of con trick, and I just think that uh, um, it will end up badly uh, for the people who um, uh, were, were taken in by the, by the vote. Mm. Of course, it's uh, UK, US is a very different uh, economy. Yes, well, I mean, the, the, I mean because the, uh, um, we got, got to realize just how different the US is um, for, um, from, from Europe. 70 million people voted for Trump even the second time, and even more than 70 million people want to carry guns. And this seems alien to uh, Northern Europeans. And that's why I say we can learn more from the example of the Scandinavian countries than from America. Yeah, that gun right is uh, something that comes from, uh, from the history of the uh, United States, and there were reasons for that. Uh, but here we have a different, uh, different past. Uh, indeed, and we're lucky for that, yes. So, do you think global government governance is the best approach towards uh, global risks? Or do you think uh, uh, each country can uh, can work out their uh, uh, their deals with partners, uh, like, separately, without using a global organization? What do you think? Well, I mean, I, I think um, uh, we've got to bear in mind the reality now is that there are global companies, um, the, 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 the big um, internet, internet companies and Amazon and all these, um, which uh, in a sense they're 
provide a huge service, but um, they are not under the um, legislative uh, control of any single country. And that is why, uh, as we know, they pay far less of their profit in tax than a small business has to. And this is a plain injustice. And this certainly needs um, some sort of uh, uh, international um, uh, regulation. Um, people talk about the regulation of uh, uh, AI and the internet and all that. And we certainly need regulation um, because otherwise um, there's no way um, that um, uh, regulation or control of these um, huge global conglomerates can be implemented. So I think that that's an example. And I think there may be other needs for organizations rather like the um, WHO. I mean, maybe uh, if we have a deal uh, for countries to cut, cut carbon emissions for yeah. reasons of mitigating climate change, um, then there may need to be a separate organization rather like those to actually monitor progress and see if countries are um, actually implementing what they're pledging to do. Um, uh, uh, in, in cutting CO2 emissions. So that's an example. Um, uh, there could be a, uh, a commission which is international for uh, uh, dealing with uh, climate change and energy policy generally, because that's becoming more international. So, um, um, and, and aviation obviously is international. So uh, I think um, even though um, we may want more regionalism in some context to go to smaller scales, yeah. um, there are some uh, areas which are consequences of the way technology has developed, which do need to have more international regulation than the, uh, the current system allows. How would you ensure that organizations like uh, the WHO or uh, there are many organizations like that, do the interests of uh, the citizens of the world rather than particular interests and in the corporate interests and in the specific countries' interests? This is very difficult. This is going to be a very difficult thing. Well, it's difficult, but I would have far, far more hope that they will be altruistic than that uh, Amazon will be. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, so, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the reason why I'm saying that is that because, I mean, if we consider what happened with the WHO, uh, recently the United States uh, uh, stopped uh, funding the WHO, so now the WHO at the moment is mainly... Quite disgraceful decision that was, hmm. It's mainly founded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That those are the first ones in the list. It looks like uh, the director is uh, has got strong links with uh, China. Um, so there is a huge influence uh, of China in the WHO. Uh, maybe there is less influence uh, from other countries and so on. Yes, but uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, especially you know if, if you think of the what the. China's done for the WHO compared to what Trump did for the WHO. Uh, the Americans don't have any high ground in that area. Although, as you say, uh, Bill Gates' foundation uh, has been a, a definite plus. Um, and uh, uh, thank goodness there are some um, billionaires with his uh, um, concern about these problems, especially Africa. And I've just been reading a book he's uh, publishing next month on uh, climate change and how to deal with it. Okay, okay. And... Uh... Another thing that uh, the Americans pulled off from was the Paris Agreement uh, for the uh, carbon emissions. But if you look at the graphs and the statistics, I mean, the, the, the carbon emissions uh, have been steadily going down for America and the United Kingdom, European Union and so on. I mean, for the West in general, they've been going down since uh, the beginning of 2000. So I think we've been doing a good job irrespective of uh, who the present was. And uh, so the problem then becomes, how do you make sure that uh, countries like uh, India and China don't pollute too much? How do you enforce that? Yes, yes. Well, first, I mean, I think we shouldn't be very smug because, of course, uh, um, uh, two things have happened in the last 30 years. Well, one is uh, going from coal to gas. And the other is um, that uh, um, a lot of our sort of uh, um, emissions in this country um, have been uh, transferred to China because they manufacture lots of stuff we buy. So you've got to uh, allow for that sort of thing before you uh, interpret these figures properly. Um, uh, so so uh, I think um, we have a long way to go. And um, if we look at the, the, the figures, um, uh, China um, is uh, producing CO2 at about half the level per capita that we are. 
But of course, India is far, far lower. And uh, one of the things that I think is very, very important is that uh, um, India, uh, which needs to develop, India needs more energy per capita to develop, it needs a grid and not just smoky stoves burning wood and dung in people's homes. And so they need more. Um, and the important thing is to arrange that they can uh, leapfrog directly to clean energy without being forced to build more coal-fired power stations because that's cheaper. And so, uh, in my view, that's why it's very important for countries like ours to accelerate our research and development into clean energy in all its forms. And I would include nuclear in this, and also in the energy storage, batteries and smart grids and all these things, um, so that the cost comes down as technology advances and uh, India can, um, can then uh, uh, jump, uh, leapfrog to it, just like they've never had landline phones, they've leapfrogged directly to mobile phones. Um, and so uh, we should work with India, not neocolonialism, we should work with, with India to have an expanded research program uh, so that um, they can um, uh, expand their energy use, which they need to do, clearly, for air conditioning, nothing else, um, without uh, producing more CO2. Because if you, if you look at the, f the projections, then um, it's true that we could uh, reduce our per capita emissions still more by energy efficiency in various ways. Um, but um, uh, India is probably going to need to increase its energy consumption by quite a big factor if they're, if they're to uh, all develop middle class lives, as it were, and have air conditioning. And so uh, what the more important thing is um, how those countries um, get their energy 20 years from now. And we've got to do all we can to ensure that they can get that energy um, in carbon-free ways. Thank you for listening to this conversation with uh, Professor Martin Rees. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below, like, subscribe, turn on the notification bell, and uh, support this channel on Patreon. Uh, this podcast is also available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can find the links in the description.